the honor of, of having me here, this panel, this, this very important topic. Uh, we each are going to speak very briefly. We have a lot more to say than time permits, uh, but we'll blast through uh, a, a lot of slides, and then hopefully the majority of the time we'll be able to, to go into conversation. My wife and I wrote this book called Anti-Cancer Living, which focuses on six areas of lifestyle that we know are linked with risk of cancer and influencing outcomes after a diagnosis of cancer. And I won't have time to get into all the science and show you all the data, uh, but encourage you to take a look at that because you can go much deeper and, and see the evidence. It's in multiple languages. I prefer to, to show and not tell, but this morning, this afternoon's talk will be a bit more of the telling. Uh, this uh, book was finished, actually, and I realize this coming here today, on March 8th, 2018. On that same day that I finished the final version and sent it back to the publishers, I was diagnosed with stage three melanoma. And interestingly, that exact same day, I got the email from the MRA saying that I was awarded a grant to study lifestyle and melanoma. On that day, I didn't know I had melanoma because the pathology hadn't come back. I just knew that the cells were malignant. The pathologist actually didn't use the word cancer, even though I work at MD Anderson and been there for over 25 years. And she found it awkward to say, I'm afraid you have cancer. She used that very technical term. So an interesting concept around information. So I underwent uh, neoadjuvant uh, immunotherapy, Ipinevo. This was you know, pre all the data that we've heard just coming out. And it just made sense. We've been doing that in the world of breast cancer for uh, decades. Uh, and, and of course, this is now the new standard of care. So we know how to prevent the majority of cancers in our world. And these same factors, I won't get into all the details, we know will influence outcomes after a diagnosis. Diet, exercise, alcohol, maintaining a healthy weight. And of course, in the case of melanoma, that, that early childhood uh, excessive sun exposure for the majority of melanomas, five. Uh, blistering sunburns under the age of 20 it increases the risk of melanoma by 80%. That, that is just a staggering number. And of course, that is why melanoma is expected in, in the next 20 years to become actually the number one cancer in the United States because of individuals in, in my generation that had those exposures who are now uh, after decades, the melanomas are starting to show up. So the key is how do we create an inhospitable environment to cancer growth, even if you have that DNA damage, the mutated cell. And in our cases as patients, how do we create that inhospitable environment to maintain control of cells that uh, are already there? And so in the book, we talk about these six areas. Uh, and I'll only be able to get into two of them in some depth today. Uh, the next speakers will go into much more detail about the exercise component, and I'll focus more on the stress and dying component. What's important to know is that this isn't just about feeling better. All of those factors, in particular uh, stress, diet and exercise influence all the cancer hallmarks, the biological processes that need to be activated to allow that original mutated cell that's happening all the time in our bodies to allow that cell to be able to continue to grow out of control and form a mass and ultimately threaten our lives. So yes, these factors are important for feeling better, but they also impact our biology. Um, and most importantly is that these factors influence each other either positively or negatively. Chronic stress can disrupt our relationships, disrupt our sleep. Lack of sleep influences metabolism and is linked with, with how we process 
the food in our body, chronic stress, can actually decrease the beneficial effects of healthy food. So the concept of synergy is really important in and around the six areas. So uh, somebody actually used a, a technical term on this last panel, which was the amygdala, the fight or flight response. And although the fight or flight response is really healthy and helpful in the short run, when it becomes chronic, it is extremely damaging. And the stress hormones that are released during the fight or flight response will help you fight or flee, which of course is not what we need to have going on when we're experiencing a chronic unremitting stressor, and in particular a stressor that is threatening our lives. What we know is that stress hormones, in particular norepinephrine and cortisol, can get into the tumor microenvironment and make it more hospitable to cancer growth. And we know that from very elegant animal studies. We know that from patients who experience uncontrolled chronic stress, anxiety, and depression don't do as well. They don't live as long. Individuals who have that stress response blocked either through through interventions that we'll speak to briefly or even pharmacologically with beta blockers actually do better and live longer. So yes, chronic stress, depression, anxiety are a common reaction to, of course, a life-threatening illness and challenging life situations, but we can manage it and we need to manage it, be able to, again, create this inhospitable environment to cancer growth. Now, it'd be great if it was as easy as, as finding an easier job, a smaller house and a different family, and those of you who have all of those know uh, that that is likely a good prescription, but we can't really write that prescription. But there are so many things that we know from the behavioral perspective, as was alluded to in the last panel, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, as well as the more non-conventional approaches that you see listed there, things like yoga, tai chi, qigong, these interventions not only have a tremendous evidence base and are actually on the cancer care guidelines for managing symptoms, but we also know they have an impact on our biology. There was actually a, a very interesting study done uh, quite some time ago, an archival study back in the 90s by Fauzi and Fauzi and colleagues at UCLA, specifically with stage two and three melanoma patients, just a six week cognitive behavioral based group program, and they found better quality of life, mental health symptoms, higher immune function, specifically cell-mediated immunity, which is relevant for controlling uh, melanoma, being an immunogenic cancer. Um, and they found the effects were maintained over six months, and they actually saw survival differences when you compared the intervention to the control group. So these behavioral interventions make you feel better and they may have an impact on longevity. We know things like meditation actually change not only our biology, but even the uh, neuroanatomy, uh, leading to smaller amygdala, larger hippocampus, helping with memory, helping with uh, literally managing the stress in our lives. And it doesn't take long. Studies have shown that even just a 10 minute meditation leads to changes in the epigenetic phenomena, which is what's controlling ultimately our biology. So let's shift really quickly to diet um, and thinking about how we've transformed the food that we eat over the past 50 years or so. It's really not recognizable. Uh, a farm that raises cattle that should be eating grass, they don't eat grass. Uh, the, the pork in our society is, is raised in an extremely unhealthy manner as well as uh, the, the poultry. And sugar consumption is also something that's changed dramatically in the past 50 years. And there's clear evidence of a link between excessive sugar, and not just as a refined sugar that's added in foods and actually hidden in foods, but also just the highly refined foods, the high carbohydrate, high glycemic load diet that we know is linked with uh, cancer outcomes. And in this study, uh, epidemiological study where you can see here, um, 
is there a pointer? There isn't a pointer. Um, that just looking at, at you know, this candy bar and chocolate consumption uh, and, and risk of developing melanoma. Alcohol is a carcinogen. I'm just the messenger here, but it is, it is clear that, that zero is better than one, one is better than two, and the guidelines are going to be rewritten uh, because there is no self -level, safe level of alcohol uh, when we want to reduce our risk of cancer uh, as low as possible. When it comes to diet, it, it's, it's quite simple, although the industry wants to complicate it. Uh, that we just need to eat more legumes, whole grains, nuts, reduce our reliance on animal proteins, in particular red meat, for certain cancer. And you see there uh, what, what the benefit could be. This is uh, data that was just published a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at uh, response to immunotherapy as it relates to following the Mediterranean diet for patients with melanoma on uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And you see this, this linear relationship. The, the closer their diet was approximating the ideal diet of the, of the Mediterranean diet, the higher the probability you're going to respond to immunotherapy. We know, as I was saying earlier, the diet influences all the cancer hallmarks, uh, and very importantly, the microbiome. And this is the research that MRA funded us for, was actually to look at lifestyle factors as it relates to response to immunotherapy. Um, and then we know the microbiome influences response to immunotherapy. In this paper that we published two years ago, we collected uh, self-report dietary data from patients. We got blood samples. We got the microbiome sample before immunotherapy. Um, I was the PI of the human-based study as well, of course, as, as a participant in my own study once uh, I became a melanoma patient. And what we saw uh, was that the patients who were on a high, higher fiber diet had a higher probability of responding to treatment and better survival. What was a bit surprising was actually the patients who did the best in addition to high fiber were ones that were not taking a probiotic. So if they were taking a probiotic, you see on these other curves, it's patients with high fiber who were taking a probiotic. So the probiotic actually negated the beneficial effects of the high fiber diet. I kind of wrote my own personal story in, in this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, essentially saying that the safest thing we know what to do now to improve the microbiome is to eat a high fiber diet. So am I telling you to become a vegetarian, this one line saying to the other and trying to eat more vegetarians? No, not necessarily, but the majority of the plate needs to be uh, plant-based. It needs to be whole foods um, and, and not all of the protein coming from animal sources. This is incredibly healthy plant sources and these uh, are high in fiber. And all these prebiotics, the foods that feed your microbiome, of course, come from the plant world. And then being cautious about the fermented foods, the probiotic foods, similar to a pill, we don't want to overdo the limited amount of bacteria, healthy al although it is, uh, in, in fermented foods. So some fermented foods is good, lots of these soluble fiber-rich foods. So just to close here, we didn't talk about social support, but that's the critical component. We can get into more details in the discussion to harness your team to, uh, to be there with you, to make changes with you, to support you, to engage in some type of mind-body practice to decrease that excessive sympathetic nervous system arousal that is natural in this world we live in. And if you do that on a daily basis, you, you create uh, you sort of turn off the fuel to the tumor microenvironment. Sleep is critical for immune function, important, of course, for immunogenic diseases. We'll hear more about exercise, focus on food, uh, and then be careful about environmental toxins. Harness the benefit of the synergy. So the more you engage in each of the area, the more successful you'll be in each area. And, and this is hard. This is, 
This is a practice. The more we practice, the better that you get. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to pick it up with exercise. So we're just going to keep, keep rolling. Um, so my talk is called Movement is Medicine, the role of exercise in melanoma care. And I want to talk a little bit about sort of the entire spectrum today from preventing cancer to what to do once you have cancer. And we can go into this in, in some detail today, but happy to chat with anyone as well. So this is not a new concept. This actually dates back to the days of Hippocrates. We knew that exercise, moving your body is good for you. This wasn't actually formally studied until the 1980s, believe it or not. This was the first dissertation that was ever written on exercise and cancer. It was in 1983, looking at patients with breast cancer getting adjuvant chemotherapy. And the question was actually very simple. Can these patients exercise? So before that time, and actually for many years, including now, after that time, patients were told, you should relax. Right? Don't exercise, take it easy, be gentle to your body, all of those types of things. Right? This study actually showed that women can exercise, it is safe, and their physical performance is better if they do. Okay? And this is women getting high dose chemotherapy for neoadjuvant breast cancer. Since I started this at 1985, this is a, just a PubMed search of the words exercise oncology, which is what our field has come to be known as. Um, and you can see this has just taken off exponentially, especially really since the early 2000s. Um, and you heard a little bit in terms of symptom management, but also focusing on cancer outcomes. So I'm going to talk about both today. Um, so there are consensus guidelines. They're written by both the American College of Sports Medicine and actually within the last year or so, we've seen them make their way into the ASCO guidelines as well. Um, and they are in the NCCN guidelines for symptom management, but not yet for disease control. Um, but that was all done by the American College of Sports Medicine based predominantly on meta-analyses that show that exercise is safe during and after treatment, which was a huge finding, um, and that improvements can be expected in fitness, so your ability just to do the things you want to do. We heard, you know, changing your laundry, getting out of bed. Um, those simple measures of aerobic fitness, quality of life, and fatigue. Um, also, uh, pertinent to this group, though it was studied in breast cancer, that exercise is safe after lymph node surgery and actually can help prevent lymphedema. Patients used to be told it was a cause of lymphedema. So what do we know about exercise? So we know it's good from a symptom perspective. That's not hugely surprising. What about from a cancer outcomes perspective? So if we look at a variety of cancers, as you can imagine, things like breast cancer, colorectal cancer, they're heavily studied. PA here stands for physical activity. We use that term instead of exercise because that includes what you do on a daily basis, your steps on your Apple Watch and all of those types of things. Um, so pre-diagnosis and post-diagnosis, you can see in breast cancer and colorectal cancer, as well as in prostate cancer, you see decreases in cancer-specific and all-cause mortality. That's great. What about melanoma? We have no idea. Um, and essentially, when I started this type of work, this was what we knew, which was not a heck of a lot. Um, and we set out to kind of understand what this looks like in the field of melanoma. So I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But I want to talk about the risk of developing cancer first. Okay? So this is, um, there's not a pointer. You can see a middle dividing line here. Anything to the left of the line means that exercise is good at preventing that type of cancer. Anything to the right of that middle dividing line basically means that exercise could increase the risk or is associated with an increase in risk of developing that type of cancer. So there's a lot of little things here. You can see there's a lot of stuff to the left of the line. Okay? What I'm going to point out, unfortunately, is that melanoma is to the right of the line. Um, not great. Right? This actually suggests that there is an increased risk of melanoma in patients who self-report high physical activity. 
I get asked this question all the time, which is why I'm talking about it here. Um, and a lot of patients come to me with that face. I, that was my face when I read this paper, too. Um, what they forgot to control for is that people do most of their physical activity outside in the sun. And many people did it before age 20 and got blistering sunburns. Um, and that was not controlled for in this study and has not been controlled for in any study of physical activity in associations with melanoma. And so I don't think there is really an association with increased physical activity, increasing your risk of developing melanoma. I think if you don't wear sunscreen and you spend a lot of time outside, what we already knew is your risk of melanoma goes up. Um, so the memo here, wear sunscreen when you exercise outside, but you should still exercise. Uh, so coming back to this idea of what happens if you actually have a tumor, okay, we, we talked about risk of developing a tumor, but what if you actually already have cancer? As patients, as patient advocates, you wanna know how to help your loved ones, how to help yourselves. So there are numerous ways that I don't have time to go into today in that, that exercise can affect cancer. Um, this is from a review we wrote quite a few years ago now um, of the many mechanisms that exercise could have to affect the tumor. But what I'm gonna tell you is a lot of this starts with our understanding from doing this work in mice, right? And mice are not people, I totally get that. The flip side of that is trying to study this in people is actually very difficult because people who exercise tend to do things like eat better, sleep more, right? Wear sunscreen, do other things, right? Other healthy behaviors. So teasing out the effects of exercise in a person is actually quite difficult, which is why many of us, when we're trying to understand these biological effects, come back to mice, okay? Um, so mouse models of melanoma are actually not new, but mouse studies of exercise in melanoma, pretty new concept, actually. Um, so this paper came out um, when I was a medical oncology fellow. Um, and showed basically if you give a mouse melanoma cells and you give it access to a running wheel and it runs, right, versus sedentary, you just don't give it a wheel, right, the, the tumor volume, so if you inject the same amount of cells at the same time point, the tumors are smaller in the animals that run. Okay? Great study, right? fundamental proof of principle. And there's some mechanistic stuff here, science-y words that we don't necessarily need to dive into, but this was shown pretty conclusively. The question really became why is that true and how can we harness that to make our therapies work better? So that was really what I set out to do um, when I was a fellow and a postdoc in Jed Wolchuk's lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And this was a very simple study. Basically, you take some mice, you inject them with tumors, you exercise them, or you randomize them to no exercise. We used a treadmill so we could control the amount of exercise, the intensity, all kinds of different things. And then we studied the immune response. So this looks like I'm a mouse personal trainer, and I am, and I should just put that on my CV also, because um, I spent a lot of time running mice on treadmills. Um, but the very simple experiment is give a mouse melanoma, right? run versus sedentary, and see what happens. And if you look here, you can basically see that that lighter blue line, the sedentary mice, they have tumors that are bigger than the mice that exercise. So exactly the same as we saw in that physical activity, the jump on, jump off the wheel, right? we can see in an exercise or training model. Now what happens if I actually take away the immune system? So now I take an immune deficient mouse that does not have a normal immune system. And you can see, actually that effect goes away. Right? That tells me, this is the definitive experiment that tells me that the immune system is critical to mediating the exercise effects on tumor growth, okay? Now, we have a lot of work to do, some of which I have done and don't have time to show you today. Um, but to me, this is the, the basis of all that we talk about with exercise, especially in the context of melanoma. It has profound effects on the immune system, and that affects how tumors grow. There are many ways we could think about mechanistically combining this with our other therapies. So obviously this screams, please combine this with IPI and Nevo and TIL therapy and all those other things that we talk about every day. And trust me, I'm doing that work. Um, but also radiation therapy, 
Right? If we can improve the blood flow, we know that radiation works better. Things like chemotherapy, which is actually how I started in this field. We can deliver more chemotherapy with exercise. Um, so lots of potential synergy there. Um, but if I want to stand here and write you a prescription for exercise, there's some things that I need to know. How much? Right? How often? The intensity, do you need to do high intensity interval training? Is going for a walk for 20 minutes sufficient? We, have, we don't know the answers to this. The type of exercise, is resistance exercise versus aerobic exercise versus some combination. Is that better? I can't answer that question for you today. Timing, is it better before treatment, after treatment? Does that not matter? Should you lay off the day of treatment, the week of treatment? Not sure yet. And how do we really then understand this well enough to combine this with our therapies? And so this is a lot of, you know, we want to think of exercise as medicine, and I tell all my patients to exercise. I recognize some faces in the room. You've all heard me say this. Um, but if we want to be able to prescribe exercise, these are the things that we need to understand. And this is a lot of what I spend my time working on. So if you are a patient, a patient advocate, how do you learn more? How do you find programs like this near you that can help uh, walk cancer patients through exercise? So this is the best website that I know of. It's called Exercise is Medicine. It is put on by the American College of Sports Medicine. It will literally link you to exercise rehab programs for oncology patients in your area. You search by zip code. Um, so check it out if you're interested. Um, with that, um, I will say thank you, and we'll answer some questions at the end. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Alexander Woodkowski. I'm coming from Portland, Oregon. I'm a dermatologist at Oregon Health and Sciences University. Today I'm going to talk about non-invasive imaging tools that help us uh, both clinicians and patients and survivors to improve precision and early melanoma diagnosis. These are my conflicts of interest. Uh, and first of all, I have three special thanks today. The first one is to Melanoma Research Alliance for inviting me here today and also allowing uh, us to donate uh, the devices that you may have all seen inside of your bags today. I also want to thank my first mentor, Professor Giovanni Pellicani, and I think uh, the quote that he told me on the first day of work really symbolizes one of the ways that I approach my patients. So the only guaranteed treatment of melanoma is its earliest detection and its complete removal. We have all the tools, we just need to use them. The, second, the third thanks I want to give um, is to Professor Sancy Leachman, who is my mentor and the chairwoman at Oregon Health and Sciences University. And I think that that statement that Sancy says almost every day, if you see something, say something, and then do something. <laughs> so going into my short talk, if we think about melanoma, it starts from a very small size. And then in its progression, it becomes visible to the clinician and to the patient at different stages. We have different tools that can help us to identify melanoma at its different progressive steps. The three main tools that we use in a clinician's office are dermoscopy from the left. Uh, we have options such as a 3GEP sticker biopsy that looks at genetics. Uh, we also have a reflectance confocal microscope that allows us to look and perform a painless virtual biopsy of the skin live at the bedside, kind of like a virtual pathologist. It actually lets us look at the individual cells. Uh, and then you can see here in the progression which tool fits in which position. So at this time, the reflectance confocal microscope allows us, because we can see the cells, we can identify tumors at their very, very early stages, as you'll learn today. These are really the take home points that I really want to stress if you take something from my talk. So patients, partners, family and friends identify over 50% of skin cancers. So melanoma is like a calligraphic ink and not a pretty one, but it's written on the skin for somebody to see. And really the first people that see it are you as survivors, you the patients who have the lesion on your skin. Whether you see it or somebody in your vicinity, it's important to see it and then say something. 
Uh, there is a limited access to dermatology providers. The average wait during the pandemic was between nine to 12 months. Now it's about three to six months, even for some patients who are, who are established. Um, it's important to know that patients and survivors are capable of engaging in their own health and using tools to help self-triage even sooner than they were doing before. Clinicians can improve communication with their pathologists. I'll show that in my talk. And then uh, I would like to present a unique technique that we established in Oregon called confocal ink stain biopsy uh, that I think we can really expand um, and scale within the medical community because it's a very simple technique to reduce pathology sampling bias, which ultimately re results in improved precision. And then I went a little bit too fast. Follow your own intuition as a patient and then follow your instinct as a clinician and the rest of my presentation will be examples of that. So three cases. The first one was a patient at the time, 27 year old female uh, in San Francisco. She was three months pregnant um, and she identified a lesion or her partner identified on her left scapula on the left part of her back. And she went to a primary care physician and asked, what do you think about this lesion? And her report to me is that the primary care uh, family doctor said that, well, it doesn't look good, it doesn't look bad. I think you should get a second opinion. And so that was the official recommendation from a dermatology provider. And so when she started calling in March of 2020, when the pandemic started in San Francisco, the response was, we can't see you for six months, nine months. She was in transit moving to Portland, Oregon, had called over 10 locations, including ours, and we were bombarded with uh, requests and the inability to uh, uh, see the patients due to staffing issues and to the COVID restrictions. And so the patient had this instinct that something is wrong and she didn't take no for an answer. And so she went on to our favorite search engine, Google, and she looked up on Google, Portland, is this melanoma? And so she found a program that Dr. Leachman and I started with our team uh, where we lend out these devices as part of an e-visit. And so the first time I met the patient was when she submitted a photo from her kitchen, as you see here. So a medical grade image, exactly what I use to diagnose and triage my own patients, the patient submitted to us in an e-visit. And we have the three hallmark concerning features. So when I saw this lesion, I said, I need to see you immediately, and I invited the patient the next day with the anticipation, of course, to perform a biopsy. Before I performed the physical biopsy, I used the confocal microscope. This is the virtual biopsy I was talking about. The principle, it works, it creates bagel sections of the skin non-invasively, so we attach it to the skin. It takes very quick photos in about one to two minutes, and we can see the cellular level at different, sorry, cellular level view at the different levels of the skin. So we can diagnose melanoma, basal cell, and squamous cell carcinoma. And you can see its comparison to pathology on the right side. And the actual size of the device in my hand, it's quite small, so it can move from room to room. And so I performed that virtual biopsy, and if we look in detail, we can actually see individual cells. I can see down to one cell, one nucleus. So what I was seeing here was a lot of atypical, we call it pleomorphic uh, uh, nucleated cells, which represent atypical melanocytes. The architecture is very disrupted. So from the dermoscopic image and the confocal presentation, for me was an absolute melanoma in situ, at least maybe severely dysplastic. So I removed the lesion and I received an initial diagnosis that it was a compound nevus atypical type. What that means is that it's not absolutely okay and it's not absolutely bad. It's somewhere in the gray zone. For me, this is in the light gray zone. And so because I was very concerned, I was thinking this is in the darker gray, black would be melanoma if we think like a scale of how we grade lesions. And so there was a mismatch between what I was seeing and what the pathologist reported to me as the clinician. So this is where you as a clinician follow your gut instinct. If it doesn't seem like you're matching, ask questions, call, ask to do additional tests. So we did, oh, I'll get to that in a second. And so the reason for that is because the pathology diagnosis dictates the way we manage the patients. So you can see here, if I were to go purely based on the initial result, I have five or six different options how I can manage this patient. Which one is the correct one? Ultimately, it's my job and my responsibility to do what is best for the patient. So I asked for additional tests. We did some genetic expression profile, ancillary tests. That being positive led to additional staining tests 
that were done and ultimately upon reevaluation after clinician instinct and request to really check it again, it was called a melanoma in situ. And so from the very beginning, this patient had a melanoma in situ. It just was not observed due to some sampling bias, which can be improved by confocal microscopy. So ultimately, the correct way to manage the patient is to perform a wide excision and then uh, call it, I would say, end of story period in that sense because an insight to melanoma chances of metastasis are close to zero uh, or basically none, especially when you're doing a five millimeter margin excision. So this is important because it, it influences the way we manage the patients. So we created our own workflow, which is in publication now. We're tracking patients over two years now within our group and seeing how they're doing to date. Using these tests and using this methodology, none of the patients have had any recurrences. The second case is to highlight scarring. So there's also a psychological aspect to melanoma survivors and those persons who have not had melanoma, uh, but have been succumbed to having a lot, a lot of physical biopsies. And so this is the presentation I received only a f uh, two weeks ago. And you can see four lesions sent to me by another provider uh, dermoscopy photos, all of them are concerning based on dermoscopy. So if you don't have access to the sticker uh, evaluation test, the 3GEP adhesive sticker, or you don't have access to confocal, technically you need to biopsy physically all four of them. But which one of those is actually the melanoma and which ones are not? And so we can use it, the confocal, and we did that. And you can see, and I'll present in a moment, that only one of the lesions had atypical cells. The rest of them were absolutely OK uh, um, and did not present with any atypical features. And so because of that, we can actually reduce invasive biopsies considerably in our setting by at least 50% for this patient, 75% reduction with the same safety and effectiveness as traditional methods. And this has been uh, researched and published and tracked for over 10 years, mostly in Europe, but there are several centers that are doing this in the US. Oregon is the first one in the Northwest. And so coming to the fourth lesion for that patient, the one that had atypical cells, we can see the dermoscopy photo here. But if I go and do a biopsy, is every single piece of this tissue that's presented to the pathologist a melanoma? Well, the answer is bifold or binary. Yes, if it's a full-blown melanoma, there's an unequivocal, without a doubt, a melanoma. But if it's an early melanoma, which is our ultimate goal, find it early because that is the true cure. Where is the melanoma starting in this lesion? Well, we won't know unless we actually see the cells at this bagel sectioning view from above. And so we did that. That square represents the surface area I could see with confocal. This is just a piece of that area. And we, we saw atypical cells with nuclei only in specific sections, so precise that we actually know exactly where the cells are. So that's one extra level of information. The second one is the one that we provide to our dermatopathologist. So we actually mark, and our team, uh, uh, we started this technique, we were the first to publish this. So we actually mark the lesion with a special ink, and then we it adheres to the skin with FDA quality vinegar, let's say, but a special, a special spray. Um, and then we send it to pathology. So when they make the slides, they actually look first in the areas that we marked yellow. And then this is the, the publication that we had. And that particular case came back as a melanoma. And so that's important that we use this tool to be more precise. The third and final case uh, is to show how precise can we be with the current tools in our armory. And so this patient, 60-year-old female, came for a neck up exam. I identified this very, very small, like literally ballpoint pen, you just touch the skin, this little uh, black dot, we call it a darker pigmented macule. Um, and so I saw, this is the dermoscopy photo on the left, and I told the patient, you will think I'm crazy. I think it's the smallest melanoma ever. And this is after I've read the publications, worked on a couple, on, I'm familiar with all the textbooks, I have not seen anything smaller. The reason I said that is because its dermoscopic presentation was not of a benign nature. It has this pigment around the one little pore on the left. So 
So I did confocal microscopy, that's the virtual biopsy on the right in black and white, and we see lots of bright reflective white cells that are aggregating or gluing to one pore on the skin. And so I biopsied the lesion completely to make sure that for patient safety, and I received an initial result that it's absolutely okay, and there wasn't even one mention of the word atypia. I'm not suggesting that the pathologist did something wrong. I'm trying to show where there are limitations in pathology and early diagnosis of skin cancers and where tools like the virtual biopsy, genetic expression profile testing, whether they're uh, in the setting of non-invasive, so um, uh, in vivo testing can give us that extra level of information if we have discordance. And so I follow my judgment, I asked questions, I said please order more tests, and so that was done, a multitude of uh, different tests, so genetic expression profile diagnostic tests, special staining, and ultimately the lesion, only once in my life have I ever seen the word major discrepancy, was that this was actually a melanoma in situ. So, a correct and precise diagnosis, it finally was published on PubMed in January of this year, and then a special thanks to our entire team, especially Sansi. Uh, not only were we peer reviewed and validated for this lesion, but also the Guinness World Records is coming out this <laughs> month for uh, smallest melanoma and smallest skin cancer detected to date. Now, I'm not saying, although as a survivor, I think that you would like to hear that, but it's difficult to say, hey, everybody go look for these pinpoint lesions. But I'll be honest, if we found everything that small, or in general, at the in situ stage, we would reduce mortality almost completely. Because again, the cure is early diagnosis. Now, people fall through the cracks. That's why we need to have all of this support from treatment uh, uh, that we're talking about today. But ultimately, long-term goal is to totally prevent it through early detection. Uh, so what are our next steps, just the tail end of my talk here? Um, uh, we developed artificial intelligence that received FDA breakthrough designation status, and we're finishing clinical trials at multiple sites um, in the United States to have a triage that's very accurate, a triage, not diagnosis, triage uh, in under five seconds. So we'll pr provide updates to, the, to everybody here as that becomes uh, more public information, but just to show you that this is something that a physician's assistant can use, somebody who hasn't had five years of training in dermoscopy like I have or our colleagues, or somebody who just finished school and wants a supplemental tool, this is something that our institution is working on to bring to the public. So summarizing, what, are, what is my mission and what it should be our mission? It is to catch the inevitable early with what I call the three Ps. So that's passion, which you can't fake it, prevention, and precision. And we have all of the ingredients to do this together. So I hope that this information uh, will be of benefit to the audience. And of course, anybody can do dermoscopy, even my own little uh, two-year-old son, Piat. So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Stress, sleep, exercise, the diet, great community, all these things, including a great set of doctors who know what they're looking out for. My name is Bill Evans, and I am a husband, father of two grown-up children, a fourth grade teacher. Um, I'm a competitive cyclist. And three years ago, I, was, uh, I had a lymph node that needed to be checked out, no point of origin, but I have cancer, metastatic melanoma. And so as a data-driven cyclist, um, I had been for 30 years in various cycling disciplines. Um, I know that if at 53 I need to compete with the young 20-year-old neopros, which I still am doing, um, that I need data. And so that is what I've always been doing. Uh, over the past years and all the way through my cancer journey and continuing on. Um, well, I check every day my sleep. Um, everything that these fine people have talked about, this is the center of my universe right here. 
And so uh, I'm so fortunate to be here to talk to you a little bit and to answer your questions. But I'm um, uh, basically at UVA uh, off and on getting my scans done. Um, I went in, luckily, right at the beginning of COVID three years ago, actually exactly three years ago. And um, basically, the oncologist in, in Fredericksburg said it's time to go to a center. And so everybody was shutting down for COVID, everybody. And so UVA had a kind of a door that was open, and I jumped right on through there. And so it was love at first sight. And um, immediately, they uh, decided that a, a radical neck dissection was the first step. And so from then, I did uh, 13 months of, of immunotherapy, Nevo. And I started getting back into the exercise a little bit at a time. Um, I'm looking for data. How much am I allowed to do 10 to 15 hours on the bike? Am I allowed to do strength training? Can I lift more than 10 pounds? Uh, all of this, I was trying to search for answers. Um, it was pretty lonely. It's hard. There isn't a ton of data out there that I was able to uh, get. Now, it's just amazing how much uh, that I'm finding now. But um, it was a really difficult time um, trying to figure out how much I can do during my therapy, particularly. Um, I would basically not feel well, fatigue, all of the things that the rashes, um, you know, all of that happening. And then slowly I would be able to get into my cycling discipline. And where's the intensity? Is it too much, too little? Um, what can get me back on, on the race course? Um, and so I found a balance. Actually, the balance found me whenever I was able to overreach just a little bit. And it took me months and months to start to figure out where my breaking points were. Um, but it was always from, you know, I, I got a special ring that is a sleep tracker, heart rate variability, resting heart rate, to make sure that I was squared away when I got up in the morning. The diet, always squared away. Whole foods, you named it. Um, you know, more green juice than, than probably is okay. Um, <laughs> um, not sponsored. And, um, but anyway, uh, this, and then choosing the right time of day. I, I had a great, dermat I have a great dermatologist um, at UVA who said, um, if you're doing four hour bike rides, go from eight to 10, come home, go back out late, 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 and get the other hours in. And so I started to do that. Um, every suntan lotion, every sunscreen, um, I, I had it all. I've tried it all. It all ends up in my socks at the end of it all anyway. But um, anyway, this has been uh, an, an amazing journey. Um, I'm here if you have any questions about um, what are the possibilities. That's, that's, that's why I'm here. No slides. Nobody ever wants to see people throwing themselves around a four corner bike race, NASCAR style. Um, but anyway, thank you. All right, and one of the things that I, I hate about this job is I have to be a little bit of a timekeeper. So, so we are running a little bit behind, but I think we have time for two or three quick questions. And I saw the first hand over here. Um, so thank you very much, Bill, for sharing your story. Um, I was, and I also wanted to ask um, Dr. Warner this question too. Uh, based on the data that you and the research that you've done. So um, I was also very active. I was a runner. Mm -hmm. I was running um, not a huge amount. I mean, not crazy, but probably 10 to 15 miles a week. And uh, I um, had zero symptoms of a five centimeter tumor in my right lobe until I developed post-obstructive pneumonia and actually went to the ER for pain. Mm -hmm. So I, my question was, firstly, to Bill, as an athlete, um, did you have any other symptoms, just a swollen lymph node? And, and my question also so, to Dr. Warner is, my own theory, 
and I'm an N of one, but maybe Bill can join me in this theory, is that if you do have an, you know, if you are pretty athletic and you have a low heart rate, um, what I realized afterwards, right, was that my heart rate had slowly been increasing from like 45 to 50 to 55 to 60. And it was like my heart was compensating for um, the lack of oxygen from my lungs. And, but I didn't know that was happening. And I wonder if there's almost like a downside to exercise in, in delaying diagnosis because you don't develop symptoms as quickly, your body's more able to compensate. Um, not that I don't exercise now. I, at three months post my upper and middle low back to me, I ran a 5K. But <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a great question, one that we don't have all of the answers to yet. Um, I think there are very mixed data in people who exercise, and particularly higher level athletes like Bill, um, about diagnosis. Some are so in tune with their body that they actually do notice mm -hmm. the two to three beats faster of their heart rate and they actually are picking that up, you know, whether it's through an activity tracker or just, you know, athletes at that level really can tell the difference between a heart rate of 49 and 52. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum, which I think I probably was when I was a division one athlete, which was my body hurts all the time and I ignore everything. Um, so it, the data are quite mixed um, about sort of time to diagnosis based on physical activity. There are undoubtedly symptoms based on where a tumor presents things like, you know, a lung or a mediastinal mass can certainly increase heart rate and other things. Um, but it's so individual, it's really hard to put the data together. And so um, I, I think what I tell everyone, um, and, and we've heard this as a theme throughout the day, is you, know, you have to trust your instinct, you have to trust your body. If something seems not right, you need to, you need to talk to someone about it. If I could jump in, I mean, the, the, the data that I was using uh, just prior to my diagnosis three years ago, um, power meter on a bicycle, which is produced in wattage, watts, um, the metrics with my heart rate, my, my, my resting heart rate, all of those things, there, there wasn't anything I, I was involved in. Of course, if you're involved in bike racing, you're crashing a lot. Um, and not because you're bad, but just because it's uh, 80 other people throwing themselves around. Um, but um, I didn't heal very quickly. Um, but then about a month before, my uh, functional threshold power had dropped about 12 to 15 percent. And so um, that was kind of my first sign that something wasn't right. But again, um, I was we were transitioning. The school had just shut down because of COVID, and so I wasn't quite getting all the rides in that I, so I attributed it to a lot of things because we could easily be in denial as athletes too. Um, but I did sense that. And since then, um, looking at my, like if I would get an, one of my Nevo infusions, um, resting heart rate through the roof, um, you know, for, for about four or five days afterwards, heart rate variability drops all the way down. For me, dropping down into 20 to 25, um, which is the span between the beats. Um, and then the, the fatigue, which is just, uh, you know, but, um, and then now after, uh, sky's the limit. I think one of the advantages of people wearing, you know, Apple watches, activity trackers, you name it, um, it, it is this, this congregation of data that we're starting to get. Um, so I've done some work with a company called Whoop that is an activity tracker um, that measures things like heart rate variability. And I figured out, you know, four days before I got COVID that I had COVID. Mm -hmm. I, didn't know what, I didn't know what I had, but I knew I had something. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I am a full-time doctor, so feeling tired, you know, I'm a full-time doctor and a full-time researcher, I, feeling tired is my everyday life, so that wasn't, um, you know, a sign that I was going to notice. Um, but, you know, my, my activity tracker actually was like, hey, there's something up, right? And thankfully, you know, in the grand scheme, it was just COVID and I was really sick for a week. 
Um, but I do think we're going to start to see more of that as more and more people are wearing activity trackers. And a lot of us are working with the data from you know, some of these activity trackers. So you know, when they ask you if you have an Apple Watch or other things, if you want to opt in, it's actually super helpful to researchers like me um, to, to do that. And it's obviously anonymized data. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that. Actually, my question is about tracking inflammation and using HRV. I also have an Aura ring. I have a BioStrap, not the Whoop strap, but maybe I'll get one too. <laughs> and I work with a, uh, a group of biohackers because that's a, something I'm interested in who um, have their own algorithm uh, to track inflammation. And they work with various types of um, patients and they did their research on COVID patients. Specifically, so uh, my, my question is to Dr. Warner and, and Bill, I guess maybe you could weigh in about using inflammation as a marker to guide how much exercise to do, especially when it comes to endurance exercise that increases inflammation more than HIIT and resistance training, uh, but you still need that. So is, is inflammation a marker that one could be using? Can wearables uh, track that? Because there are great differences between aura and WHOOP and BioStrap in terms of HRV, but is there an algorithm out there that you guys like to use that you see coming down the pipeline, specifically using inflammation as a tracker to help guide this research? It's a fantastic question. Um, I think you're five years ahead of where we are um, in terms of these are questions that we're answering or we're asking. We don't necessarily have all the answers to that yet. Um, inflammation does not directly correlate with HRV. Um, in, it's not a sort of a direct linear relationship, so we can't necessarily just extrapolate that way. Many of us were hoping it would be something that simple, um, and it, it turns out that it's not. Um, and as we know, right, in the melanoma world, some inflammation can be good and can treat your cancer, and some inflammation can be bad. Um, and so where, where do those you know, levels lie, and how does that factor into an algorithm? Lots of really smart people, including yourself, working on this. Um, but I, we don't, don't have answers yet, but they're, they're questions that a lot of us are working on, for sure. <laughs> 